Something Worse Than a Bear by Braxton Hi Swamp Dweller, my name is Braxton Pierce. I've sent you a few stories about some of my experiences at home here in Georgia. But what I'm about to tell you happened last summer when my wife and I went to Washington State for a week-long camping trip. We brought our camper with us to a reserved spot in Eatonville. It was amicable and warm during the whole week. Anyway, the first two nights were great as we cooked up some chicken and beans on our grill and roasted some marshmallows to make some s'mores for a little nighttime snack. The third night is when we had this crazy experience. A loud sound had woken me up a little after midnight, and then it woke my wife as our kids and babies soon were sound asleep. They can sleep through anything. Whatever we heard wasn't that far from our campsite, as it could have easily been about 10 to 15 yards away. It let out this strange whooping sound, and we could smell it. It smelled like hot garbage and roadkill combined. It was unbearable. Do you know how most campers have those dim yellow lights on outside? Well, we could see the lights from the inside window, and the smell got worse as this thing walked right in front of the yellow light of our camper. Now, my first thought was a bear, but bears don't typically stand on two feet for no good reason. All the food we ate we made sure to cover up and had all the leftovers because there were grizzly bears around. We even cleaned the grill so they won't smell the food from it. This creature had to be standing at around 7 or maybe even 8 feet tall, and we heard it make this low growling sound. Now, I've been around quite a few bears in my life and I've never heard them make a noise like this. So at this point, we're about 100% certain this was no bear. My wife and I were frozen solid, and I could see tears running down her cheeks. I whispered as silently as I could. Shh, try to be quiet. Out of nowhere, this thing suddenly makes a loud whooping sound again. This time it does it in groups of two, and it sounds much louder because it's right in front of the RV. Our camper even shook a little bit as it was walking around us. It had eventually left about 30 or so minutes later, and we could eventually go to sleep. The next day, we woke up at about 7 a.m. We stepped out of the camper and saw other people outside gathered around, looking at these absolutely massive footprints that the creature left behind in front of us. I asked them, Excuse me, we heard this thing last night. Did you guys hear it? Most everybody said they did. Look what it did right in front of your guys' camper. I looked at the set of footprints in total shock while everybody else was getting pictures of it. Everybody packed up and went home, even us. We even got our money back for the spot. I decided to inform the BFRO team to investigate the prints, and they got negative results, saying there weren't any known prints of the local wildlife, so it was likely 100% a Bigfoot. We personally decided to never go back there again, but the BFRO teams have been doing more investigations in that area, so hopefully we'll get more good hard evidence of these things. Thanks for sharing my story. Bigfoot in Alabama by Bradley G. Hello Swamp Dweller, I'm a big fan and have been listening for quite some time. Anyway, this is my encounter with what I believe to be a Bigfoot. A bit of background, I am a pretty avid outdoorsman. I grew up in the woods and always knew about Bigfoot, but never thought I'd see one. So to set the scene, it was 2016, maybe 2017, around New Year's time. Also, my birthday and my family decided to take my best friend Lorenzo and myself to Alabama. I live in Texas, to visit some distant relatives for my birthday. We hung out with the family for a while and eventually gave up, and went to hang out in the woods like we always did. Anyway, Lorenzo, my cousin Tyler, and I explored the woods. While doing so, we came across an old abandoned mobile home. 
so we looked around and entered. Breaking typical teen stuff, we finished exploring the house and walked into the master bedroom, where we found a massive nest made from pine branches. We were in the mobile home for about 25 or 30 minutes when suddenly we heard this ungodly roar come from right outside. Then, the home started to rock back and forth violently, to the point it felt like it was going to tip over with us in it. So we crawled out of a hole in the ceiling and started running. As we returned to the house, I turned my head and I swear on everything I know that's true, I think I saw a Bigfoot. As I looked at this massive creature, it locked its eyes with me and it started chasing us back to the house. We even cut through three yards between my cousin's house and the woods and it stopped at the edge of the woods and watched us walk into the house. I wish I could say that was the end, but unfortunately, it's not. In the middle of the night, I awoke to my cousin and Lorenzo telling me to shh, it's right outside the window, so I go to peek through the blinds. And when I part them there, I was staring face to face with this thing and it looked angry to say the least. So we grabbed the guns and went outside where we saw it, and there was nothing. So I take out an alternative cigarette and stare into the woods. We go to the abandoned mobile home about halfway in there, and I feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I slowly turned around, and there it is, only a couple of feet away. This thing again looks absolutely angry. So, being a bit inebriated now after my alternative cigarette, I do the only thing that I can assume to do. I run. I book it all the way back to the house with my friends as we're hooting and hollering the whole time, absolutely scared out of our mind. And yes, we're loaded to the teeth with guns, but running was honestly probably the best option. Eventually, once we all made it to the house and calmed down and got our wits about ourselves, we decided that we would never talk about this again. We don't want to sound crazy. We don't want people to think that we're some crazy yahoos out there. But I know what I saw, and I know what we experienced. The Tickle Monster by Hauntingly Familiar 2 It all started when I was just a wee lass. Now, I've been dealing with ghost-related stuff for most of my life, but this is the strangest occurrence. Every night, from the age of 4 to 7, maybe even 8, I would have chronic sleep paralysis. Anyone who has ever experienced sleep paralysis knows how frightening this can be. My experiences were just a little different. I would be visited by a creature that I named the Tickle Monster. It was always the same thing. The first thing that would happen would be a sign popping up where the bed meets the wall. It was generally written in blood. The sign would say, He's coming. He's here. Or something ominous. Then, the window or door would be open, and he would appear. I am trying to remember his exact appearance. However, I remember that he had long dreadlocks, a pale complexion, and long bony fingers that were more like claws. He would approach my bed and proceed to quote-unquote tickle me. Being a child, I didn't know how to describe what he was doing, but that was the closest description I could come up with. This was not a joyful or fun experience though. I wouldn't be able to move or scream and once he finished tickling me, he would just leave. I would fully wake up and call my father or my mother and this happened almost every single night, and the sequence of events would mostly stay the same. My mother would try to get me to communicate with the Tickle Monster as if he were real. This thing it had an ungodly mouth. Its mouth was full of razor-sharp, shark-looking teeth. She never doubted what I was experiencing was legitimate, but nothing really ever came of it. I don't know if she thought it was just something in my brain, and it would go away after a while, or if it was a legitimate experience. One night, it just stopped and never happened again. I've only had two instances of sleep paralysis since that time, and neither of them had anything to do with the Tickle Monster. I've looked this up online to see if anybody else had this experience, but I'm not, I'm not having any help finding it. 
My manager told me of a voodoo demon who would steal children in the middle of the night or something like that, but I'm not sure it's an exact match. Part of me thinks that this was a product of an overactive imagination, but there's still a part of me that believes it could have been something more. Maybe some sort of cryptid, paranormal entity, or some other otherworldly creature. The Blob Monster by Anonymous So it was around February of 2017. I was 15 years old and had a dry throat at the time. For that year, I wanted to build a shed in the middle of the woods of my backyard, maybe just to go hang out in as a fun project to do for the summer months. So on a cold, dry, windy, but sunny day, probably around noonish or late morning, I started the hike alone in the woods of my backyard to find the perfect spot to put down this shed. The shape and the geography of the property section with the woods are weird. The woods part of the property pokes out like the Oklahoma panhandle, and to get to the deepest woods of my property where I wanted to build the shed, you must walk up a hill and then that hill eventually plateaus. Also, that hill is easily the tallest in the general area. And on the day my encounter happened, I was to see hundreds if not thousands of feet, especially since there were no leaves on the trees. It's a two minute hike. You can see things like rusty barrels and metal fences in the woods, mainly because my backyard woods were a popular hunting spot back in the day. This is evident with the rusty metal barrels and beer cans I can find dating back to the 1980s. I hiked through the property and reached the Plateau Hill part. Also note that someone's house was probably 100 feet from where I was. I had a pretty good view of the entire property, and there was also a barn in someone's house quite far from us where I could see way out in the distance. So for a few minutes, I started looking for a good spot to put this shed. I eventually picked one and imagined how to build the shed. I wanted to start from scratch. While doing this, I heard a five note whistle, song type thing in the distance. Now I'm no musician, but I will try to describe it. It was like two long flat notes with a short break between two and then the next note. A higher pitch swinging note followed. Then quickly, an average swinging note. Then back to a long flat note with a higher pitch than the first two. And whoever was whistling kept repeating it and had lungs of steel. Now I honestly looked around for quite a few minutes to see if I could find whoever was whistling. It sounded like it was coming from deeper into the woods, way downhill but I didn't see anyone. I also checked the house and the barn to see if I could see anyone, and sure enough, there was not a living, breathing soul. I also thought that I didn't hear the rustling of leaves either. The whole woods were covered in them, and the rustling of leaves was loud and could easily give away your location. But there wasn't any rustling. I immediately ignored it, as probably one of my neighbors or something. Also, please note that the whistling was not an animal, but a human. It had to be. Birds have chirp-like whistles, but this was a lot more breathy like a human. So I returned to my spot, content that it was a person probably just walking through the woods. That was the most logical conclusion. But the whistling kept getting closer and louder, still playing the same five notes. And still, I could not see a single person, heard no rustling of leaves or anything like that. I was very stubborn that it wasn't something paranormal and had to be a human. Even though whatever was whistling was coming towards me and I still had no clue who or what was whistling. The whistling was going on for over a couple of minutes now and eventually it sounded so close to me that it felt like somebody was literally on top of me. It sounded like the whistling was also coming from all directions at this point. So now I started to get a little bit spooked. I concluded that whatever this whistling was coming from had to be a threat. So I started returning to my house. It was only like a two or three minute hike. It's not like I was terribly far out like I said. I didn't run out of there or anything like that. I walked back as home as possibly calm as I could. I was spooked but not terrified or anything. I also felt like if I ran then whatever was whistling at me would pop out and chase me. So I walked and stayed calm to keep whatever it was at a stalking taunting phase. It sure did feel like whatever was whistling at me was stalking and taunting me. Now, I must be honest, 
This next part of my experience felt quite trance-like, so I could have just hallucinated this part and the whistling. I've had things like sleep paralysis episodes several times in my life, and when I'm exhausted, I do sometimes hallucinate stuff. But I wasn't tired at the time, nor had I had an hallucination episode for quite a long time. All of my tired hallucinations and sleep paralysis episodes last from a fraction of a second to several seconds. So if this were a hallucination, this would be the most crazy, in-depth, longest one I've ever had. So back to my story. I'm about a minute away from making it to my house's backyard, still hearing the whistling. I decided to look up, and there it was. Something that was all gray, blurry, with no facial features. A humanoid-looking thing. It was flying above me counterclockwise. It could have been about five to six feet in height, with a wingspan around the same. The thing had the silhouette of a person, with a head, two arms, torso, and legs. It looks like a T with a circle on top, acting like its head. It was almost like a blob, it almost had like no body definition. I trusted my gut, and instead of running, I kept walking, despite the threats. It kept me as safe for this long, I thought I'd keep doing it. Then finally, I took one step onto the grass in my backyard and suddenly everything weird stopped. There was no more whistling, the flying thing was gone, and that feeling of foreboding and being in a trance absolutely dissipated. I remembered smelling roses, though like it was peaceful. After that experience, I wanted to build something other than a shed in the woods. For years, even a little bit to this day, I hate being near that backyard alone. I took a long time to discuss this story because I honestly just ruled it as some sort of paranormal ghost encounter. The gray thing was possibly an angel or something like that. But after I looked on this thing called Cryptid Wiki and heard about the Kinderhook Blob Monster, there were kind of similarities to what I had experienced and I did notice that there were other things called Blob Sightings. First. I don't live crazy far from Kinderhook. I could easily take a drive over there in like 30 minutes. Two, I saw a blob-like creature that sounds exactly like that monster. So I'm not saying that's what it was, but I have a good idea that I met the blob monster. You have graciously shared some of my stories in the past. So, I wanted to send you in another. My name is Evan, and I think I just had the weirdest encounter of my entire life. In one of my previous stories, I mentioned me and my friend were heading to Ocean City, a popular beach in Maryland, about three hours from where I live. Well, I decided to go down again and spend some time at our condo, just relaxing and taking a load off. Summer has been very wacky due to the pandemic so I did not plan on spending a lot of time down on the beach. I am one of those people who enjoy the beach vibes but do not like going down on the sand or getting in the water all that much. Well, unless I am more alone and there are not loads of people clogging up the beach. Well, I drove down in my Chevy Nova on July 21st. It was just me this time, although my family was planning on joining me a couple of weeks later. So anyway, I sped all the way there wanting to avoid stopping at all. When I pulled up, I hopped out shutting the Nova's door and running up to the condo. I unloaded all of my bags onto one of those hotel wheel carts that they sometimes have in elevators. Our condo has one for whatever reason, and it was much more efficient than running up and down the stairs carrying my bags. Well, once I got everything in the room, I stepped onto the balcony. We were on floor five of the complex, and it was a beachfront. I cannot tell you how nice it was to wake up to the sound of crashing waves every morning. Anyway, the ocean looks very choppy, but there are loads of people down on the beach, not caring for six foot of space at all. Well, that was not going to be me, I thought, as I headed back inside. It began to rain at around 2pm, and the beach was basically clear. I jumped on this opportunity and ran down, and surf fished for about an hour and a half rain pouring down on me the entire time. I caught nothing, but when I fish, I feel alive. It is one of those things like bow hunting for me that just sends me to my happy place. 
So the first night passes, and I order some seafood for dinner and go back to bed under freshly changed sheets. I wake up and make some coffee. I had brought down my Nintendo Switch, but I felt like I was being called to get off my butt and do something outdoors. That feeling won over, and I decided what better way to spend a nice day at the beach than to go to Assateague Island. For those who don't know, Ocean City is basically a massive sandbar, and several islands and small specks of land are surrounding it. One such place is Assateague. It is a national park, and my next door neighbor who is studying to be a park ranger really got me into going to national parks. The great thing about Assateague is that it's basically multiple environments in one. Let me briefly explain. The island has protected marshland, as well as beaches. It is also a swampland, and is rather big, with forested sections. Basically, one massive natural playground for those who like being in the great outdoors. There are also horses that have been there for generations living on the island wild. They have a dune trail for off-road vehicles like jeeps and certain type of pickup trucks. But since my Nova is from 1970, and sand basically equals rust on a classic car like that, it was a no-go. But I drove down and parked in one of the visitor lots. I hopped out and decided which way to go. I first hit the swamp trails and the mosquitoes destroyed me. Cursing at my stupid choice not to bring bug spray, I finished that trail. I then took the marsh path and waded in the beautiful marsh waters, seeing crabs and small fish dart by my legs. No, I know nothing scary has happened yet, and I'm sorry about that, but it will soon, I promise. Anyway, I find a good stretch of beach to lay out on. I did manage to remember to bring a towel, and so I laid out on the sand and closed my eyes. My bag and my Nova's keys were next to me, but I was not worried about this thievery. One, the park was basically empty, at least my part was anyway, and two, I'm 6'2" and I let my hair grow out to my shoulders. I look like a madman when I'm not properly groomed, but I would never hurt a fly. Anyway, I lost track of time. I probably got to the beach and laid down around 12. Well, my stupid self wakes up and it's already getting dark. I cursed my stupidity as I began to sit up. I screamed. I was sunburned so badly. I had put on sunblock, but I, I guess it had worn off. My body felt like it was flaming, and tears welled up in my eyes. I have had some horrendous injuries in my time, but sunburns are bad. If you have not ever had a bad one, imagine your skin bubbling and peeling away before your eyes as you are as red as a dang tomato. Now, here is where the scary stuff begins. As I'm trying to figure out how to hobble back to my car, I hear a loud splash. Normally. I would not think much of anything about it. There are some exceptionally large fish and even sharks off the coast of Ocean City and Assateague. I even once caught a 9-foot sand tiger shark near Assateague two years prior, but that is beside the point. I realized that this splashing was maybe 7 feet out. That was very odd. The chances of a big fish being that close to shore and making that much noise were slim, to say the least. I dropped my bag and my keys as I slowly and painfully got to my feet. It took maybe five steps to get to the water when it made a sound I would never forget. Picture the cries of a mountain lion mixed with the low calls of a large whale. It was scary, sad, and entrancing all in one. Extremely hard to explain, honestly. My mind immediately went to tales of sirens and mermaids whose haunting calls would lure in unsuspecting sailors to their demise. I did not believe there were mermaids. I am not a skeptic by any means, but mermaids just seem so far out. We have only explored 2% of our oceans though, so honestly who knows what's out there. These thoughts and many more swirled around my brain as I backed farther and farther away from the crashing waves. The waves were much smaller now, and whatever made that noise was splashing my way. I began to hurry back and grab my bag. I sped out of there like a bat out of hell, back towards my car in safety. I spat profanities as I realized my keys to the Nova were back on the beach. I half hobbled, half sprinted to the spot I had just left, all the while feeling my skin peel and burn. 
I shone my phone light on the spot in the sand where I had just been. I saw them, baseball slits scraping my knees, and snatched the keys. As I went to get up, I met its gaze. It was the strangest thing I had ever seen. It was pale, almost translucent, like a jellyfish. Its skin looked aged but strong and muscular. Its legs were long and strangely tall like a basketball player, but there was not an inch of hair that I could see. The hands looked amphibious, and it had what almost resembled a tail. Its face was the real horror though. It looked like a clean mannequin face that you would see clothing being hung on in a department store. Except for a nose and a tiny slit which I assumed was its mouth. It was featureless. My heart was in my throat as I felt sweat pouring down my face. I, for whatever reason, smiled at it like a fool. Maybe thinking this thing had some sort of emotions. It then smiled back. Although it was all wrong, the tiny slit of a mouth began to expand, the face ripping and tearing apart to form an abnormally large grin. Blood trickled down this thing's face as it smiled back at me, with razor-sharp teeth glinting in my phone's flashlight. It is something that will haunt me to my dying day. I ran, screaming like a little girl. I was surprised no park ranger had heard my scream. As I ran back to my car yelling, I heard it scream back almost mocking me in a way. I got into my car and sped out of there. When I got to the condo, I ran upstairs as fast as I could. I locked the door behind me and began breathing erratically. When I composed myself, I sat down on the couch and basically passed out. The next day, I went to the local clinic and got my burns checked out. They gave me a prescription lotion to help with the burns and I went home immediately. I looked everywhere for an explanation of what I saw. It cannot be a skimwalker because I am almost certain they do not go into the water and do not live in marshes like that. Could it be aliens? Maybe some other shapeshifting cryptid? I don't know. Thanks again Swamp Dweller for sharing my story and encounter. I really like your channel, it has kept me going through these rough times. If anybody in the comments has any idea what this thing could be, please let me know. I have always kept an open mind about the creatures that can roam our world, partly because I'm inquisitive by nature and partly because of my mother. She always taught us to be aware of our surroundings and respect nature. One of the first things she taught me was to listen to the animals. They will tell you if something is out there. One time, years ago when I was a teenager, we had traveled to my dad's hometown in Texas for a family reunion. His hometown is small. You can walk through the central part of the town in less than an hour, and everyone else lived in homes further out usually. They usually had about an acre or more of land around their homes, which was very nice and private. In the evening, we had joined my dad's large family at a hoedown near the edge of town. There were people dancing and drinking and having a good time, while me, my brother, and one of our cousins and her friend just hung out watching the festivities. We were talking about these teenager things that you'd always talk about, you know? Just who we liked or disliked at school, etc., you know? We looked out towards the edge of the party, where a fence bordered the location. We were at this separated area, where it separated the yard from the scrubland on the edge of town. We could not see far out since night had fallen, and the lights on the poles of the fence only illuminated the fence and the brush around it. As I looked out, I noticed something, an object that was half hidden by a small tree, but odd in that it was not swaying in the breeze like the rest of the foliage. I pointed it out to my brother and cousin, who spotted it as well. As we observed it, a few things became clear. It was a creature, about five feet tall if I had to guess. It was a tawny brown color, like a coyote. One of us asked if what it was was a coyote, but we could definitely tell it wasn't, it was just too big. We cautiously, or foolishly, made our way closer to the fence till we were only 20 yards away from it. 
This thing was a further ten yards from the fence on its side, just far enough to be out of the range of the light. We stopped in our tracks as we could see enough to make out that this creature wasn't something we'd ever seen in our lives. It was a creature, covered in fur, hunched over on long legs, with human-like arms. Long, gnarled hands ending in sharp claws. Its head was half hidden by the tree, but we could see a canine-like head with a long snout and pointed ears, just like a coyote. It was staring at us, and we were staring at it. We quickly ran back to the party, realizing that we were closer to this thing than we were to our own families. If this dogman, a term we didn't know at the time, was as fast as the werewolves we had seen in movies, the fence would have been no obstacle for this thing to get us if it felt so inclined. We were all shocked into silence. Once we were back at the hoedown, we just sat there and looked at each other. Did we just see that? Do creatures like that really exist? We were simply stunned at this encounter. We didn't even know who would believe us, so we just said nothing. The next day, my family was heading back to Oklahoma. My brother and I were secretly relieved considering what we had seen. But my cousin and her friend lived in Texas, in my dad's hometown, which was part of that thing's territory. I hope she never had to see it again. I quickly moved on from that night, but that encounter has always been in the back of my mind. As time went on, and I learned about creatures that people have seen in the woods, I heard at least a name put to what we had seen, and I hoped I'd never see anything like that again. But as they say, careful what you wish for. In 2019, I was out of my boss's farm for a three-day work excursion in the summer. His farm is about an hour away from Oklahoma City, and 80 acres of land that's mostly woods and pretty isolated his nearest neighbor is probably over a mile away. I have been to his farm many times over the years and was very familiar with the woods around his place. There was a trail that led into the woods from the compound, and I'd walk it every morning with his dog when I came to work there. I never walked to this trail alone, and never unarmed. Not because I was worried about Dogman or Bigfoot, but because wild boar was known to live in the area and they were the ones I was worried about. In all the years I had been up here, I had never heard about Bigfoot or Dogman being seen in the area, but plenty of boar. On this particular day, I set out towards the trail in the late afternoon, his dog Buddy right at my side. The trail was not exactly well-traveled, and it was more grass than dirt. Halfway down the trail, where it was more open ground, I could already see a few deer tracks, some raccoons, even an armadillo scrape in the ground. As I was counting the different tracks, Buddy wandered off the trail into the trees to sniff at something that caught his attention or find a place to pee. I called out to him to not wander far, stepping towards the edge of the trail to do so. As I did, I looked down and saw something that made my heart stop. Right at the edge of the trail, right where the bare earth gave way to grass, was a large canine-like footprint, bigger than any footprint Buddy could ever hope to make. As he was a 75-pound German Shepherd, and I have a 150-pound Great Dane at home, and even his paws aren't this big, I put my size 10 boot next to it, and the track was over half the size of my boot. It was decently fresh, no more than 24 hours old if I had to take an educated guess. I looked back from where the track led, but could not find any more tracks of this thing. It's like this thing jumped over the trail to avoid leaving prints in the dirt. Something jumped 15 feet across the trail to avoid leaving any trace of itself. I quickly looked around and strained my ears, but I could still hear the birds singing, insects chirping, and even Buddy was calm and relaxed. I called Buddy back to my side and set off down the trail to get back towards the barn. I did not want to stay any longer in case whatever made those footprints was still in the area. Further along the trail it became more surrounded by trees and leaves covered the trail. It's only because I had walked this trail so many times that I knew how not to get lost. But as I navigated the trail, I noticed a large branch that was right on the edge of it. 
Branches were nothing new on the trail, of course, and with the ice storm that had occurred over the winter, many trees had lost a lot of branches. This one itself was 12 feet long and the size of my forearm at its thinnest, and larger than my thigh at its thickest. But what made me notice this one was that it had been turned over. I could tell by the imprint in the leaves and dirt. While hogs could and would turn logs over for food, hogs did not do this. There were no hog tracks or scrapes around it, and I was mentally traced back to the trail behind me where I had seen that footprint. I realized that this branch was right in the line with the footprint. And when I noticed that, everything had fallen silent. No birds. No bugs. I looked for Buddy, but he was no longer at my side. He had continued up the trail and was now ten yards ahead of me, looking back at me with a nervous posture and seemed to say, We need to go now. I briefly looked around me but saw nothing in the woods, but I remember my mom telling me that old phrase, You may not see them, but they can see you. I put a hustle in my step and caught up with Buddy, and we continued up the trail, and all but ran to the barn since I cleared the tree line. I couldn't help but think in the back of my mind once I was back inside. They're here. They're here in Oklahoma. It's foolish to assume that they just wouldn't be here, you know? For some reason, I thought they may just stay in Texas because of the range or whatever. Despite me only actually seeing one in Texas and only a track of one here, this week, my brother had told me that his co-worker thinks he saw a dogman on the edge of his property recently. His co-worker lives in El Reno, Oklahoma. My boss's farm is only 10 miles from that town. The Creature from the Ritual by Braxton P. Hi, Swamp Dweller. It's been about a month since I last sent in a story about some unusual experiences I've been having. Recently, I've been having crazier things happen on my property. I live in one of the most secluded areas in Georgia. It's nice and private, settling on a few thousand acres with about a 250-acre lake and no neighbors except the local wildlife. It's been family-owned since 1810, as houses have been built and rebuilt. I have had to do further research to discover why these experiences are happening to me and my family. It always appears safe during the daytime, but becomes incredibly different when night comes. During my research, I discovered this property was once a hideout for a local Cherokee tribe. Occasionally, I hear knocking on wood, knocking on the house, possible rocks being thrown below the windows, and so on. My last experience was just last night when the sun was almost out of sight. Coyotes just started becoming more active. I hear them howling and the birds are always whistling. It came to a point when all the animals suddenly went quiet, and the only thing I heard was footsteps crunching on leaves. There are no bears in this area of Georgia, but whatever it was, it was huge, and our giant animal is usually a deer. This is central Georgia, not too far south of Lake Sinclair. We don't really have alligators either. I could scratch off every possible animal because those footsteps were massive. You would know it was much louder than any known animal if you heard them, like an elephant walking through. The footsteps finally stopped about 30 yards into the thick woods. The next thing I hear is what sounded like some kind of gibberish ritual, but it wasn't quite in words. I had never heard anything like this before. Even my wife heard it and we were both on the upper back porch. We liked to sit down and enjoy the sun setting to the west side of the lake, but it was already completely dark when we heard this thing speaking in what I can only assume was tongues. I tried using a battery powered spotlight to see where this thing was, but with no success, as it kept saying something over and over. The next thing I know, something was thrown towards us, landing on the porch. It was about two to three pounds. It was a rock, and it was pretty big. I picked it up carefully and placed it on a small sandwich bag. It might have been... It might have had some sort of fingerprint evidence, I don't know. I turned it over to professionals to get a good look at it, but I don't think anything really ever came of it. 
I know it might sound weird to do that, but I need to find out what's going on here and what this creature is. Earlier this morning, I began searching for professionals and only found something called cryptozoologist. Since no other known studies are based on this experience, I never told my daughters or my family about this because they wouldn't understand. My daughters are only five years old, and I don't want them to be traumatized by this. When cryptozoology appeared on my computer, it talked about the legendary Bigfoot, their biggest passion, and a few others known as cryptids. I'm hoping to go into the woods with my wife tomorrow to see if I can find any fingerprints, and I would love to share some pics with you if we can get anything on camera. The Weirdest Halloween Ever by Pample Moose Here in England, we don't do Halloween like you do in the United States. At least we don't in Bolton, a sub-district of Manchester. A few children dressed in bin bag capes with witches' hats on or a skeleton mask will knock on your door, holding up little pumpkin buckets out for sweets and some neighbors will put out some sort of paper gravestones in their windows. You know, they, they go a little bit with it, but that's about it. Last October 31st, 2022, however, the weirdest thing happened at our home. Our family were all sitting at the front of the TV watching the Exorcist movie when a hammer was at the back door. We all stopped and looked at it, and then looked at each other. To knock at the back door, you would have had to got through a wrought iron side gate which is always firmly locked. The knocking continued, getting louder and more urgent. My grandson, who was 15, got up and went to the kitchen window to investigate. I heard a stifled gasp and went to join him to see what was happening. Despite being a teenager, he is six feet tall and does boxing training, so he's no real little weakling. I joined him at the window and asked what was the matter. Face pale and confused, he said a massive bird-like creature had crawled along the lawn and crept into the corner of the garden near the back fencing. He was visibly shaken. The car park to a country park nature trail is at the back of our fence, so I immediately thought some local kids were having a Halloween joke and jumped the wall. Despite it being eight feet high, I thought maybe they were just pranking us. I told my grandson to tell the rest of the family what we had seen, and I told him I would check it out. He panicked, and I heard him shout to the rest of them still watching TV. He was shaken up at the crawling creature he had thought he had seen, truly. I grabbed a torch and went out into the garden. We have a lot of mature trees, shrubs, and bushes, and at the corner of the garden, I heard a rustling. I pointed the torch toward the noise and walked towards it. There, with its back against the fence, was a bird-like creature about the size of a small child. It was perched on a grassy mound with eagle-like talons for feet, a smooth body, outstretched wings, and a pointy face that resembled a giant rat. I was confused and walked towards it while it looked at me, with its head downwards but eyes looking up at me. It spread its wings and they fluttered like a bird when it was ready to take off. Then there was a prolonged hissing sound. I stopped and looked behind me for backup. I saw a few family members coming out into the garden. The thing gave one last hiss, rose into the air, looking more like a gargoyle than a bird at this point, and disappeared over the fence. It made some of the shrubs waver as it went. My grandson and I described what we had seen, but the rest of them laughed and said it was just our imagination. They admitted to seeing the shrub swaying, but they put it down to a giant kestrel or something. They didn't believe a word of it. To this day, I do not go into the back garden after dark. That was not a local kid enjoying a Halloween prank, nor was it a visiting kestrel. It looked like a church gargoyle. It's never been back, and I don't want it to return. So this year, if there's a knocking at our back door, my husband or son can investigate this time. I prefer lavender and lilac in my garden over cryptic creatures. Visions of Death by Sam This story takes place when I was 16 years old. I had just been dropped off at school and I was going to the cafeteria. 
I went to sit with my best friend, Jack. When I looked at Jack, I saw this creature that resembled a person but was covered in darkness. It had no face or discernible features. He was standing right behind him with his hands on his shoulder. Not forcefully, but just like resting. Its head then turned to me and followed me as I approached him. He asked me why I looked so spooked. I told him nothing because he didn't believe in the paranormal. He was a firm Christian, so anything I would have said, he would have just called me crazy. We went throughout the day and every time I saw him, it was right there with his hands on his shoulder. When I got home, I asked my mom what it could be or if my great-grandma might know. My mom told me she calls them reapers. They're not necessarily malicious or anything, they just comfort those who are going to die. I broke into tears after hearing this and ran to my room. I ended up passing out, and while I was asleep, I had a dream of my friend's point of view. He was in our friend's Todd's vehicle, and he looked like he was listening to a speaker in the back seat, not buckled in. Todd crashed into a tree, Jack went through the windshield and snapped his neck, and then I woke up screaming. My mom and sister came in to see if I was okay. I said I was fine and I just had a bad dream. Nothing to worry about. The next day was a Friday and the Reaper followed Jack. I told Jack about my dream thinking maybe I could warn him about what would happen. But I thought he would just call me crazy. The Reaper looked at me and shook its head. I wonder why it did this. Maybe it was telling me that I couldn't or shouldn't interfere. I ignored that it, it was there for the rest of the day and, and went about my business until around 5 p.m. My friend called me and asked if I wanted to go to a party. I said, yeah, just come get me and we'll go. He told me he had a ride and Todd would be there. I screamed at him, no, don't get in Todd's truck. He told me to chill. He said he was on the way and hung up. So I went on my way to the front porch for him, hoping that my dream wouldn't be real. But after an hour of waiting, my mom got a call and told me what I hoped not to hear. He had died to basically the exact same play-by-play -play I saw in my dream. I turned around and the Reaper was standing in front of me. It put a hand on my shoulder. I screamed at it to leave me alone, and it just disappeared just as it appeared. I don't know what happened. My dream came true, and it's something I'll always scratch my head about. I don't know what that creature was, if it really was a Reaper, quote-unquote, or some sort of, like afterlife messenger, I don't know, but I don't want to find out. Good evening and thank you for sharing my story. This encounter still troubles me to this day. It was the summer of 2011. I recently had turned 12 and my family thought it would be a great summer for a cabin trip. Normally, I would have been attending some sort of Boy Scout camp. Since we are from Florida, we drove north to South Carolina with my grandparents coming down from Canada to meet us. The cabin itself was beautiful, with a great view of the lake and its own beachhead. When we first arrived, I was first out of the car and running around in excitement. I was greeted by a man looking to be in his late 50s, the cabin owner. He smiled at me with happiness, which slowly grew into a nervous grin. Finding it quite odd and being a shy kid, I moved along. As I searched around the area being curious and wanting to see everything, I noticed almost a circular pit under the house. It was off-putting, but it didn't seem to bother me. Finally, I noticed a treehouse that the owner was building on the beach. As I ran to it, he yelled out, Watch yourself, son. It's still dangerous. I steamed onwards and climbed up the ladder. The man was correct as the top there were so many nails poking out all around, but since I was small, I found a place to stand and gaze back at the cabin. The wood cabin seems old but sturdy with a big porch and outside storage underneath where once again I stared at the circular pit which now had my full attention. It was nothing that I've ever seen before and I don't think I've seen something like it since. I love the woods and would like to say I am experienced but it almost looked like a big spinning ball was dipped into the earth. I pointed it out to my father and the owner who was talking. The owner responded with, There used to be a bear that nested there, but don't worry, he's long gone. I didn't like his answer, 
because it seemed strange for how it looked. I brushed it off and went into the cabin, picking up one of the bunk beds before my siblings could. The first few nights were amazing. Lots of hiking and swimming and everyday things that you would do, because we knew when our grandparents arrived, we would be hanging out most of the time. When they did arrive, we sat by the fire at night and enjoyed animal watching. It's important to note the area's geography at this point. The front of the cabin faced a wide strip of dirt leading to the beach with thick trees on either side. To the left of the cabin was the dirt road we used to get to it. Behind and on the left of the cabin were thick, dense woods with a steep slope. Now, it was the seventh night that we were there. I was awoken up by weird sounds outside. Dirt shifting under weight to the left side of the cabin. The trash bins were there next to the door from the kitchen. I heard something pushing them around. Thinking it was most likely raccoons or some sort of interested animal, I should do my Boy Scout duty and shoot them off. I dropped down from my bunk and the noises went silent. I noticed a few rays of sunlight were streaking through the air. I walked over to the kitchen to look out the window, but before I could reach it, suddenly, these long, scratching noises were coming out from against the walls of the cabin. It sounded like long nails digging deep into the sheets of a bed. Terrified at this point, I slowly back away. Then a bang shook the door and I jumped. Since it was only me, my brother, and my dog who were downstairs, we were the only ones who heard it. Instantly, my dog sprinted to the door barking and growling viciously like he was about to fight to the death. This woke up my brother who panicked and grabbed me and pulled out his hunting knife. He looked down at me with reassurance and told me to get to my parents' room. He then pushed me upwards towards the stairs and ran to the door and opened it. He then went away with my dog, the barks and running getting distance as I ran upstairs, and I woke up my father. He ran out into the forest with his Colt 45. About 30 minutes later, they both came back, including my dog who was limping. I've never seen my brother with the look he had on his face before that day, and he never had that look ever again. He's typically a very brave and capable older brother, and seeing him like that unnerved me to my bone. He was an Eagle Scout, and I was a Boy Scout. We had been in the woods, and we weren't really scared to get dirty. My dog had a stick through his front left leg, but he's a good strong boy and took it like a champ. My mother and grandmother quickly drove our animal over to the local vet. While they were gone, my father grandfather and oldest second brother and I looked around the cabin for evidence of this strange event. I was still incredibly nervous, so I kept close to the cabin and my father. The trash bins had gashed holes in them, almost like they had been punched open, and the wall above had deep claw marks in it, which standing from the level of the trash bins was about six feet into the air. That's when I noticed a smell, an odd smell that wasn't coming from the trash cans. I slowly crouched down between peering underneath the cabin and where the strange pit was. There was a dead fox, shredded into literal pieces. I told my father, and him and my brother quickly cleaned it up by using a shovel and tossing it into a bag and then into the trash. My dad contacted the owner who assured us that there was nothing to be worried about, but brought us a flare gun and bear mace. A couple of days go by, and my parents take everyone to a restaurant aside from myself my oldest brother who chased the perpetrator, and my injured but stable dog. An hour after they left, I looked out the second floor window in the direction where my brother ran a few nights prior. I was petting my dog at the same time. That's when the main encounter took place. My dog raised his head alert and sniffed the air. I glanced out the window and noticed this huge bear-like creature high up in one of the trees. It was smashing my level and was staring at me. I say bear-like because it had human-like features, instead of the fat, round body bears usually have. Their body was toned, sharp, and muscular. The eyes were the worst part. They were piercing. They were yellow, almost like perfect human eyes that locked eye contact with me. Fear flooded my brain and forced me into a fight-or-flight mindset. My dog picking up on this started growling and howling at the window. I turned to run out of the room and looked back at the creature who was now rapidly descending the tree, using its clawed hand to climb. 
I sprinted to my brother's room in tears, yelling about this beast that I just saw. My brother looked at me with worried eyes and said, This territory doesn't belong to us. Then he got out of his bed, grabbed his knife and baseball bat, and walked downstairs. I armed myself with a flare gun and bear mace, and prepared myself for the possibility of this thing breaking in and attacking us. A great slam into the back of the wall knocked the cabin around, and made it rock like a boat and sent my dog into a frenzy. Between the growls and barks, I could hear heavy breathing from outside and things being thrown at the cabin. A rock broke one of the front windows and striking my left leg. I turned and fired the flare gun out of the window which was followed by many profanities and yelling. After this, it all stopped. My dog was still growling and pointing at the corner of the room. There was no window facing that direction so I couldn't see, but I could assume it was right there. A few minutes of silence went by when my brother and I decided to call the police and our parents. Then, being idiots, we walked out of the front door and slowly walked around to the right side of the cabin. We started to hear a slow snarl coming from behind a bush, and my dog inside started going ballistic and jumping at the door. My brother started yelling at this creature and threw his baseball bat towards the bush, striking it. It sounded like it hit a tree, but we both know that we hit the creature because it let out a pained grunt. The black furry mass sprung out from behind the bush and bolted down the dirt road and we quickly lost sight of it. We hurried back inside the cabin, barricaded the doors and ran upstairs. We heard gunshots ring out moments later and my father's truck pulls in. I fly downstairs and open the door. The rest of my family ran inside and my father claimed a huge bear ran down the road and he fired a couple of rounds at it. The police eventually came after having a hard time finding the cabin. We gave them the story about this aggressive bear attacking the cabin. We left that night and my family likes to recall the story of how myself and my oldest brother fended off a hungry bear. But for me and my brother, that was not the case. When we arrived back in Florida, I went straight to my room still shaken up by what happened. When my brother came in, he looked me dead in the eyes and said, It looked human, didn't it? I just nodded and asked him about his territory remark when he looked down and responded, every animal has its territory and usually can keep it until something bigger comes along and takes it. Well, something bigger came and it took its own territory. What he said still makes me wonder to this day. It's burned into my mind. Looking back on it, the owner was so shaky around me almost like he knew there was more danger in the area than he was letting on and that he knew that we would be a target. This happened to me when I was a teenager. I think it was in the spring of 1998 when I was 14 years old. My Boy Scout troop went hiking in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. I grew up in a very small town in Tennessee, and the boys in my troop were people I would known my entire life. We were all very close and knew each other very, very well, and trusted each other. We had been hiking for five days or so at this point, and it was pretty miserable. It rained every single day, and we were all exhausted and sore, and hungry. We were covered with blisters and anything else you can imagine. The adults realized we had bitten off a bit more than we could chew in trying to do a 60-mile trail, especially with the awful weather. So we changed course and had gotten off trail to spend the night in a drive-in campground, the kind of place with hookups for RVs and picnic tables and fire pits and such. There's also a central bathhouse with showers and toilets. It was in a very remote area, far from a town or any other house. There may have been a few other small groups there, but if there were we never interacted with them or saw any of them. We were all filthy and wet and thus very excited about taking a hot shower. It was dark and we had finished dinner. A group of five of my friends including myself and my friend Jeremy, who like everyone else in our group we had known since we were babies, headed up to the bathhouse which was maybe a quarter mile walk through the pitch dark woods up a worn down gravel walking trail. I stayed behind the clean up and about 10 or 15 minutes later, I followed them by myself. I had a weak little flashlight, the old incandescent kind, pre-LED. I remember the woods were totally silent. When I got about halfway to the bathhouse, I could see the light from it off in the distance through the woods. I heard a noise from my left. 
I looked over and saw my friend Jeremy standing by an old-school manual water pump about 20 feet off the trail. The kind of pump where you raise and lower a handle to pump up water from a well. There was a strange light behind him. Like the moon had come out from behind the clouds. I was startled to see him there by himself in the woods off the trail. I asked him if he was already done with the shower. He seemed kind of, uh, sad. He said, Yeah, it's all yours. I said okay and didn't think much of it until I got to the bathhouse. When I walked in the door, my friends were all in there and I heard Jeremy talking in from the shower. All the blood drained out of my head and all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had to sit down before I passed out. My friends were freaked out and wanted to know what was wrong. I told them exactly what happened. They nervously made jokes about how I must have been smoking pot. This was long before any of us had experienced with any kind of mind-altering substances, but I could tell that they believed me. Like I said, we had known each other forever, and we knew that we wouldn't exaggerate or play a joke on each other like this, at least not to this extent. I was physically shaking. It was almost impossible for this to be a joke. We all waited together until everyone was finished showering and brushing teeth and whatnot. Then we all walked back together in total silence. When we got to the spot, whoever I had seen was gone without a trace. The water pump was there, though. No one had noticed it before because it was way off the trail and obviously not in use. We got back to our campsite and went to bed thoroughly freaked out. I remember not sleeping much that night. In all my years since then, I've never been able to figure out what happened. Was there a random teenage boy in the woods who looked just like my friend? This is unlikely. Did I hallucinate? Unlikely, but possible. Who's to say? I was in the Boy Scouts as a kid in the South Carolina Low Country. We'd go on campouts about once a month, and one of the campouts that we used to go to regularly belonged to a local man who owned some land way out in the country and let our troop use it for camping. The actual campsite was in a wooded area in the center of a big open field that was maybe 20 acres or so. The guy who owned the land wasn't a full-time farmer, so he had plowed the field but never really planted anything, and the dirt was kind of settled and scrubby, and grass had started to grow. I'm not really sure, I'm not a farmer, maybe there's a name for that or something. Anyway, the western edge of the field was a dirt road that eventually led to the highway. The northern edge was an old field that was planted with trees along enough to go where the trees were fully grown. And it was basically a forest. The southern part used to be a forest, but it was now in the process of being turned into farmland. The trees had all been torn down, but not removed quite yet, so it was just a wasteland of fallen tree trunks and roots. The eastern edge was a swamp, and there's some nasty stuff in swamps in South Carolina so we never really explored it too much. One night, after the post-dinner cleanup, everyone was kind of settling down for the night, so a few friends and I decided to go for a walk. There was a lone tree out in the field about halfway between the campsite and the western edge of the big field, so we walked out and sat under it. There was a full moon out, and the whole field was lit in this sort of luminescent type of glow, and we could see the edges of the field but not into the forest, swamp, or whatever was beyond. It was creepy, but kind of cool. We hung out for a while, just kind of talking, and then we could see lights in our campsite across the field going out as people started to go to sleep. So, we decided to head back. We got up and start walking, and I heard one of my friends say, Who's that? We all turned to look, and there's this guy standing perfectly still about 100 feet away from us. We could see his silhouette very well thanks to the full moon but it was too dark to make out any details of his face. We hadn't seen anyone come from the campsite, but the guy looked like an adult, so we assumed one of the four adults who had been on the trip with us was out looking for us. My friend called out to him, and then, this is where it gets really weird. Something that looked kind of like wings slowly unfolded from this guy's head, and he remained entirely still. He let out this long, low growling and hooting sound, like imagine if a guy was trying to sound like a dog that was trying to imitate an owl. We all took off running towards the campsite as fast as we could and did not stop until we got there. I looked back out into the field to see if we were being followed, but it was empty. There was nothing in the field at all. 
We walked around the campsite trying to figure out which adult was messing with us, but they were all in their tents and nobody had left the campsite. Nobody believed us, of course. They just assumed we had been out telling scary stories and freaked ourselves out. But I know what I saw. No, actually, I don't know what I saw. But I know it was nothing that we had brought out there with us. No More Camping by Draven My name is Draven. It's 2 a.m. at the time of writing this, which is keeping me up. So I'm telling somebody, hoping it will take my mind off of it. I live in Idaho, but at the time of the incident, I was living in Alaska, about 16 miles southwest of Fairbanks. I lived in the middle of a forest. I loved the woods. That's why I moved out here. I was big on camping. I would always be in a tent with Barkley, my two-year-old German shepherd. I didn't have a good week, so I went camping to try to take a load off. We went to our favorite spot next to a lake about seven miles from the house. Instead of taking the car, we decided to jog. I grabbed my gear, Barkley's harness, and leash, and left. I was a wildland firefighter, so flying with weight was easy. It took around two hours. Once I got there, I first set up camp, and then we went upstream to cast a line to see if we could catch anything. I caught a rainbow trout. When I got to the camp, the tent collapsed. If you have ever set up a tent, you know they don't just collapse. You have to take the tent pole out in the hole and take every corner out for it to go down. I thought this was weird. So I set it up again and got the campfire going. I cooked the rainbow trout, and it was honestly delicious. After that, I cooked some marshmallows. Not s'mores, just plain marshmallows. I don't really like that other stuff. I put the fire out, went into the tent with Barkley, and I found the sound of nature always knocked me out. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night to Barkley growling. At first, I was annoyed with him, but then I realized that the forest was dead silent other than Barkley. I grabbed my backpack and grabbed my 9mm out of it because we all know one thing. If the forest is quiet, something is out there. I sat there with my gun for a couple of minutes. It honestly felt like an hour. Then I heard the sound that still freaked me out. It sounded like a caribou, but was lower and kind of gargling. I heard a stick break like it was stepped on, and that it was very close to the tent. I fired a warning shot in the air. It seemingly scared whatever was out there off. I felt it was fine until I realized the forest noises were still silent. I'm six foot three and I tried to be scary, so I yelled from my gut, If you come back, I will shoot you. And it came back. It touched the tent. It was like whatever this was was taunting me. I fired at it and it ran off into the forest and suddenly all the noises came back again. I stayed, but the moment dawn came, I packed up, got Barkley's harness on, and got the heck out of there. We sprinted two miles and jogged the rest. I don't know what I encountered, but I'm happy it played out the way it did, and not the other way around. The Beast in Montana by Trailside Horror I live in Montana on a small 20-acre ranch with my parents, my three sisters, my twin. My twin's name is Skye. My second oldest sister, who is also a part of the story's name is Jess. I loved going on night trail rides, just at dusk. We had done this many times, so we knew these trails very well. We got our horses and set off. We were getting tacked up and ready to go and made sure we had a flashlight with us. We had reflecting bright yellow coat things, so we mounted up and started off. By this time, the sun was setting and the moon was just over half full, but we could see just fine. We decided to take a roundabout trail from the barn through a big forest and back to the barn. Sky was in front, I was in the middle and Jess was in the back. A little way in, we heard a stick break. We didn't think too much of it, as we thought it was a deer or something along those lines. But a ways down, we heard one closer. 
we paid attention and noticed there was absolutely no noise around us. It was utterly silent. The horses began to act uneasy and skittish. They wouldn't stand still and kept stepping to the side. Looking around, their ears were pricked up. Then we heard a shrill, demonic-sounding scream just to our left. The horses bolted, losing their minds. And we let them as we were scared absolutely crapless. We heard heavy, pounding steps behind us. The horses were going about 25 miles an hour and were gaining speed. The footsteps grew closer. Though I had turned my head around, the moonlight showed a long, skinny, bony creature with white eyes. And it was, I can't even explain it, horrifying to look at. We turned and had just about reached a barn where it was well lit. The horses kept bolting and didn't slow down until we were just a few feet away. But as soon as we did, the steps had just stopped. We turned to look and saw the small white circles of its eyes. We dismounted, entered the barn, and locked the door. We were freaking the heck out. Our parents were out of town, and our older sister was in her room in the center of the house. None of us had our phones. We waited until it was morning. We stayed up all night scared that if we left, it would get us. So we waited until we saw the sun. We quickly left, running to the house and told our sister, and called our parents telling them, but they didn't believe us. I'm worried it might hurt our horses or other livestock. If anyone knows what this creature is, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to learn more and get an understanding of it. Bigfoot in the Bayou by Robert Hello, I'm Robert and I live in Northeast Louisiana. A few weeks ago, my friends Drew, Gregory, and Jolene visited some of my family in Washington State. Drew and I are 18 and Gregory and Jolene are 19. We packed all our stuff in late October and drove from Louisiana to Washington. We stayed for a few days visiting my uncle and his small family. Then, Gregory suggested we camp in the nearby woods on our last night. Drew and Jolene agreed, but I needed to be more open. I don't know why. A million different thoughts ran through my head at once. In the end, I agreed. We borrowed two tents from my uncle and camped in the woods near his house. Now, to be honest, this was hardly camping. If we unzipped our tents, we could see the porch light, but just barely. That's how far away from the house we were. Also, he had no neighbors for at least three or four miles. After chilling by the fire we built, we decided to call it a night, except for Jolene, who chose to stay up a little bit longer. I figured I would stay up with her. We stayed there talking for about 20 minutes until we saw something absolutely massive stalking around. The thing is, is this thing was so massive it almost seemed like it was silent. It was about 20 yards away, and it seemed to be about 10 foot tall. We both got nervous and got in one of the tents. We woke Gregory, who quietly said, What the heck's going on? Still half asleep. Gregory grabbed his hatchet, got up on one knee. Jolene tried to explain what we saw, but it made no sense to him. Go back to sleep, y'all, Gregory said, putting his hatchet down and snuggling back into a sleeping bag. After about twenty minutes, we heard the thing walking around our tent again. At this point, Gregory was out like a light. I grabbed Gregory's hatchet and put my hand over Jolene's mouth to keep her from screaming. We suddenly realized we had left Drew alone in his tent, with nothing to defend himself. Jolene volunteered to step outside with the hatchet. She jumped right back in as soon as she jumped out. She wouldn't stop breathing so heavily. I asked her what she saw. She said she didn't know. It's just something vast and solid, black in color. I grabbed the hatchet and stepped outside the tent to see it for myself. Whatever this thing was was giant. It was looking down at our tent, and I just about peed myself right then and there. I swung the hatchet at whatever this thing was. Out of fear, I heard it scream out in pain. It ran off, and I was relieved for the moment. The scream woke Drew and Gregory, and Gregory asked what it was. But before any of us could speak a word, he looked down and saw the massive pu- But before any of us could speak a word, he looked down and saw the big footprints in the deep mud. 
Drew looked down at them and whispered, Bigfoot? My cousin came running with a pistol and a lantern in hand. What the hell was that? She yelled. Gregory pointed at the footprints. I ain't never going camping without a gun ever again, he said with a grit in his voice. I couldn't sleep again until we returned to Louisiana. One creepy night for sure that I'll never forget. Okay, so I'm a 31-year-old trucker, and you can call me Diego for privacy reasons. I come from a trucking family, and all of my cousins and uncles who drive big rigs down in Mexico have tons of paranormal trucking stories, as Mexico is very rich in paranormal activity. On the other hand, I don't have many stories. That is until today. At least related to trucking, that is. I am writing this a few hours after this has happened, so it's still fresh in my mind even though I doubt I'll ever forget today's events. So my run is mainly a trip from southeastern Wisconsin to southern Michigan and back. Now for context, once I enter Michigan, I get from the interstate and get on a rural country road, as my company prefers that we avoid toll roads to cut down on cost. They say the less we spend on tolls, the more we can pay our drivers. Anyway, on my way there, all is normal and everything is going well. I get to our drop yard and drop my loaded trailer for the following driver to take it to its final location. I look at my tablet and figure out what load I'm taking back with me. I hook up to the trailer and do my pre-trip inspection. Everything seems reasonable. I grab the paperwork for the load from the box in the front of the trailer and look through it. My company requires all shipments over a certain weight to be thoroughly looked at and certified on a scale to make sure the load is legal and not over the legal regulation weight. Well, I looked at the scale receipt and this one was not, so I contacted my company, and they instructed me to grab one of the four empty trailers and take that back to southeastern Wisconsin. This will be important later in the story. I walk in front of the trailers and slap each one until I hear that distinctive hollow sound indicating that it's empty. I do this to save time and not have to walk behind and open every single trailer. Once I found one that sounded like it might be empty, I grabbed my flashlight and started to do my pre-trip inspection on that trailer making sure there weren't any flat tires and all the lights worked, etc. I walked to the back to open the trailer shining my light in there to make sure it's empty, which it was, and surprisingly it was even swept out by the last driver, which is rare. Once all that was done, I turned on the Swamp Dweller podcast and returned to the road. About 45 minutes into my trip, I'm driving down the country road with my high beams on at least around 2am, and there were no other people on the road. As a matter of fact, I have woods on both sides of the road. This is where things get a little weird. I forgot to mention that there is an electrical storm, but there is no rain and you can't hear any thunder. I know this because I always ride with my window down. Anyway, the lightning lights up the sky every couple of seconds, and I admire how beautiful it lights up everything around me. As I come around a bend on the road in the distance, I see a person walking on the shoulder of the road. And as I approach him, he turns and waves as if to say hello. The person was a man. He was wearing a hard hat with neon green pants and a reflective vest of the same color. That is why I saw him from a reasonable distance away. But there was no construction anywhere in sight, before or beyond this point. And I know this because I passed through there on my way to my previous destination. As I got past him, I pressed on my brakes to illuminate the road behind me. At the same time, lightning struck up and lit up the area. I'm staring in my mirror, and this guy is gone. In a split second, he disappeared. I thought that was very weird, but I got over it and focused back on the road. About three minutes down the road, I hear three loud knocks on my trailer. I turn my radio down, and I try to listen closer, but I hear nothing after that and think that it must have just been a bump that I hit in the road. About five minutes later, I hear five loud knocks again on my trailer and think it's very weird. Now I drive like this every single day and I'm used to it, so I wasn't tired or sleepy. I was wide awake so I can't blame it on that. I turn down my radio and keep it off at this point and try to listen. A couple of minutes later I hear five more very rapid hard knocks in my trailer again. As I've said I always knock on the trailers to see if they are empty or loaded, and I recognize the sound quite well. So now I'm worried that I missed something when I checked the inside of the trailer. So I decided to pull over to the side of the road and open the trailer and check what was in there. As I slowed down and pulled over about a second later, maybe 25 feet in front of my truck, 
I see a huge tree fall on the road. At this point, I got scared because it wasn't struck by lightning and there was no wind. I put my truck into gear and took off because, as I said, I was listening to Swamp Dweller before that, and I was already on edge. My initial thought was whatever pushed over that tree, I don't want to stick around and meet it. So I drove around on the side of oncoming traffic, which there was none at that time of night, thank God, and went around the tree. I pulled into the next truck stop and decided to find out what the hell was in my trailer. I grabbed my flashlight and go to check. I opened the door and shined my light and, well, there is absolutely nothing or anyone in there. I get back in my truck and start driving. I don't honestly know what to do. Giving it some thought, I realized that even though I saw that man out on the side of the road as clear as day, I couldn't see his face. And as I said, when I looked back, he had disappeared. And those knocks on my trailer were getting faster and louder every time as if it was some sort of sense of urgency, as if they wanted me to stop my truck. And if I didn't stop when I did, I might have been killed by that tree. At this point, I believe it was a spirit trying to stop me so the tree wouldn't smash my truck. Well, after that, when I got back to driving, I didn't hear the knocking anymore until I got to my destination, at which point I unhooked from the trailer and proceeded to do my post-trip inspection. And again, there was nothing or anyone in the trailer. So, I don't really know. I guess, thank you to the spirit for saving my life potentially. And, uh, yeah, I don't really know what to, what to say. This story scared the daylights out of me. Thank you for sharing my story if you do, Swamp Dweller. I'm a big fan of the show. Dear Monster on the Highway by Anonymous As I drove down this deserted highway in the dead of night, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The darkness seemed to be closing in all around me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was following me. Out of nowhere, a flash of movement caught my eye in the distance. At first, I thought it was just a deer crossing the road. But as it got closer, I realized it was something much more sinister. The creature looked like a deer, but it was much larger than any deer I had ever come across before in my lifetime. Its eyes glowed in unnatural light, and its antlers twisted and turned in ways that defied all reason. As the creature charged towards my car, I hit the gas pedal and tried to speed away. But no matter how fast I went, the monster seemed to keep up with ease. Its twisted antlers, scraping against the sides of my vehicles from time to time, sending absolute shivers down my spine. Panic set in as I realized that there was no escaping this creature. I tried to turn off onto a side road to lose it, but it was no use. The creature was right behind me no matter how much I bobbed and weaved. Breathing, hot breath on the back of my neck. As I looked in the rearview mirror, I could see the creature's glowing eyes staring back at me, and I swear this thing had a twisted smile on its monstrous face. I knew that no hope was left. I was trapped with no way out. In that exact moment, I could only pray for a quick end to my nightmare as the deer monster closed in on me with terrifying speed. The last thing I heard was the sound of its twisted antlers scraping up against the middle of my car as the world around me faded to black. The next morning, I woke up in a hospital and I had no idea how I got there. But apparently, first responders got to me after somebody called it in, and I had been saved just in the nick of time. All that was noticed or found at the scene was a small strip of deer fur. I work emergency on the weekends at a very large veterinary hospital. My shift begins at 5 a.m. and I leave the house at 4.15 a.m. Although I live in a very large Midwestern city, it is always a drive-in on Sunday mornings. Very few of the city folk are out at that time. Many of them have gone to bed as it is for the weekend. That doesn't normally bother me at all. The streets are always crowded during the day, and it's a nice respite from the normal gridlock. It was a Sunday, March 28, 2020. I remember the date exactly as it was the day after the state government had issued a shelter-in-place response to the COVID outbreak. Because I worked in the veterinary medical field at an ER hospital, I was deemed essential and my routine carried on as normal. Usually at around 3am the alarm began making its annoying bonging sound, waking me up from my restful sleep. 
I started getting ready for work. There were dogs to feed and let out, lunch to be packed and coffee to be made. It was a typical Sunday morning before work. I left at my usual time and noticed that the roads were even quieter than normal. There was virtually no one out besides me and the occasional police vehicle to the point of it being surreal. As I make my way to work on the quiet streets, I came to a divided highway with two lanes of traffic going each way. The speed limit on that road is 45 miles per hour. Not that anyone obeys the law. However, it was dark out and frankly, I was enjoying having the world to myself. So I was driving the speed limit that day. As I'm driving down the right lane of the road, it barely registers to me, but it seems darker than it normally is at the time. I didn't put that much thought into it that until suddenly, almost like someone placed a thought in my head, I thought a dog was in the road in front of me at the far distance. I squinted my eyes and investigated the darkness in front of me and didn't see anything, so I ignored the thought and continued driving down the right lane. But then the distinct thought that a dog was in the lane before me blasted back into my head. I ignored this warning no longer and it quickly merged to the left lane. Just as I accomplished this, I looked at the right of the road. A man was walking steadily down the middle of the street, right towards me. As I passed him going 40 miles per hour in the lane to his left, I looked over and he looked at me. He just continued his slow and steady walk down the road. My first thought was to thank God that I did not hit him. Then I became so grateful that I paid attention to the voice in my head. But then I realized how strange the situation was. There are sidewalks and frontage roads off this road. Plenty of places to walk and not be in the way. Why would he be walking down in the middle of the road in the highway? Why did I keep thinking that a dog was on the road when I saw nothing? I kept glancing back in my rear view mirror as I continued to drive and saw no one. It was as if he just faded away or perhaps was entirely shrouded by the strange and new eerie darkness. What happened next was entirely out of character for me. I usually think about situations like this repeatedly, meditating on them, dwelling if you will. But as I kept driving, the whole event just faded out of my memory. I can only compare it to a dream when somebody wakes up with a vague recollection of what went down, and then it just wanes away as the day goes by. A couple of days later, I suddenly recalled the incident and began thinking of how strange it was. As I drove to work the following weekend at the same time, I paid careful attention to that section of the highway in particular where I saw the man walking. It immediately struck me that I could see if a figure had been walking there in the distance. The lights from the surrounding businesses and streetlights made it possible. It seemed much lighter that morning, although it was the same time of day with similar weather. Why? Had it been so dark that weekend before? A few months later, I was at work and a client came in and observed that her last name was the same as the name on the road I had been driving down the morning of the strange occurrence. I asked her if she somehow was related to that road. She told me that her in-laws used to own the land where the road was built. I casually, jokingly told her I saw a ghost on that road or something else extraordinary. She immediately became very interested. She told me that her mother-in-law had stories of strange events on that property before it was sold. I'm not sure who that man was that night. I have no idea why it was so dark or why the whole occurrence faded after it occurred. I continue to be grateful to whoever warned me to pull over and help me not hit that person. Deep down inside though, I knew that some good versus evil was occurring that morning and I was being put to the spiritual test. And although I don't understand any of it, I'm glad I listened to that voice. When I was 12, I attended summer camp to learn how to ride horses. We were going to be away from our parents for four or five nights. I was excited because I always wanted to learn how to ride a horse due to my love for animals. But I also was nervous about being away from my family and being around strangers for that long. Most of it was amazing and everything I dreamed of. However, the one night labeled Sleep Under the Stars is an experience that I don't think I'll ever forget. That night, we had to leave our bunks and go outside to sleep in tents. I hated tents, but everyone else was doing it so I figured I'd play along. There were a lot of activities that took place before bed. We sat by a campfire, made s'mores, and told stories. When it came time for bed, it was four of us to attend and I could already tell it wasn't going to be fun and I was not going to get much sleep. I just could not get comfortable 
and was wishing it was morning. The other people in my tent seemed to pass out almost immediately, which left me sitting there, trying to count sheep in the dark. There were a lot of tents in a small area since everyone in the camp was sleeping outside for one night. I was starting to get a little drowsy, when I hear what sounded like footsteps outside of the tent. I was right near the mesh window of the tent, because I tended to get hot and was hoping the cool breeze would help me sleep. The footsteps then got louder, but I tried to ignore them, presuming it was a counselor or one of the camp leaders. But then I felt a presence right over my tent. It was like someone was kneeling right outside the mesh window. I gathered the courage to look outside, and there was something out there. I didn't look long enough to see what it was, but there was definitely something there. It was silent at first, but then I heard whispering. Just mumbling and whispering for minutes and minutes without break. I couldn't really make out the words because it was so soft, but I could hear something. I thought I could hear the words, Savior, Sacrifice, Wept. I felt like I heard the words wept a lot, but like I said, I couldn't really make it out. Every so often, it would stop, and I would peek my head out of the sleeping bag to check and see if someone was there. The figure was always still there, right outside the mesh window. On and off, I could hear the whispering and mumbling all night. I tried several times to kick or punch someone in my tent to wake them up, but it never worked. Eventually, during one of the moments of silence, I must have dozed off. As scared as I was, I have no clue how I was able to fall asleep or even even get any sort of sleep, even if it was briefly. I checked the window again, and there was nothing there. About five minutes later, I heard a loud shriek and a gust of wind. When I woke up the next morning, I asked everyone if they heard or experienced anything like I did that night. No one apparently saw or heard anything other than me. I know I wasn't asleep, and that I absolutely saw and heard things that night. I don't want to say it wasn't human, because nothing gave me that idea. But what type of person would have knelt by our tent and mumbled under their breath the entire night? As scared as I was at the time, I'm glad I never had another experience like that again. I live in Burlington, Ontario, a nice lakeside city near Toronto. This story happened to me during a school trip when I was in 8th grade. It was like a summer camp thing. We were in elementary school, which was kind of like a Catholic school. Everyone in grade 8 would get to go on two trips as part of their final year at the school. One trip took place in, I believe, fall. It was usually a religious camping trip that took place about 40 minutes out of the city. By religious, I mean everyone had to participate in group activities that revolved around being a good Christian and teamwork, etc., this, of course, completely sucked as this camp was little more than just a religion class stretched into three days. The second school trip always took place in the spring and was usually a trip to Ottawa for the weekend where we would explore the city and visit museums. For some reason, it was decided my year we would take another camping trip instead of going to the city. We would go about four hours away to the Algonquin Provincial Park. The camp was on one of the many lakes in the park and was set up like your typical summer camp. Cabins were spread out near the lake and partially in the forest. There were also bathrooms and a mess hall in separate buildings. Also, just to explain, if you don't know what a provincial park is, it's very much like a state or a national park of the United States. As you would guess, boys and girls shared separate cabins. The girls' cabins were built on supports above the ground and were the ones closer to the lake. Our cabins were almost in the forest and built on the ground along a gravel road. I shared a larger cabin with about four other guys. Although our cabin was the largest, it was probably the least comforting. While the other cabins had actual windows and doors that would fully close and lock, our cabin looked like it was built from balsa wood, only had thin bug screens for windows, and a door that would not close. I should also point out that I had no experience with actual camping, as my family actually hates it, so this was a bad first impression. This is where the creepy story begins. 
On the first evening, we were all gathered outside the mess hall for a fun night activity. The camp counselors told us about a hermit that lived nearby in the woods. The activity was that they were going to take us to the dark woods in groups to see where this hermit lived. This kind of caught us by surprise as it was quite random, but intriguing at the same time. As you would expect, everyone was pretty much screaming as we were led deeper into the woods with only our flashlights looking for this hermit's house. When we finally came across this house, which was little more than just a huge log with a makeshift bed, we were led back to the camp. Although my group didn't see anything, other people started talking about seeing someone creep around the dark woods. Someone in my cabin even said they saw blue glowing eyes in the darkness. I shrugged it off thinking the whole hermit story was made up by the camp to scare us. The person in the woods was just a counselor. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of someone sprinting down the gravel road that ran to our cabin. At first, I was startled and a little creeped out, but then I thought it might have been just an animal. That was until I started hearing the gravel crunch around our cabin. It was very soft, but a person. I was suddenly terrified. My bed was right beside the door and it did not lock. An animal could have easily pushed the door open on its own and walked inside if it wanted to. There was also nothing covering the screens, so the person outside could easily see in. I was ready to scream as loud as possible if someone entered the cabin. I had my eyes locked on the door, anticipating seeing it slowly open, but it never did. The sound outside slowly disappeared into the woods. Immediately, I thought it must have been the hermit. I ruled out the possibility of it being a counselor or a teacher because it was at least three in the morning which was an odd time to check on students. Surprisingly, I was able to fall asleep a short while after. The only interesting part of the camp trip, unfortunately, was this part. The rest of the trip was dreadful. It rained nonstop for the remaining days and people from my class caught the flu from another school that was sharing the camp with us, so the bus was partially quarantined on the way back home. As time passed, I almost forgot about the creepy encounter giving it to the possibility that it was just a counselor checking in on us. The story doesn't end there, though. The following year, it was my younger sister's turn to go on the same 8th grade camping trip. Just like for my class, she also had to go into the weird hermit expedition during the first night. Although she initially thought nothing of it, during one of the other days, she and a few of her friends were exploring the woods along the lake. She described seeing a small hermit-like person sitting on a log in the distance. I know this isn't the creepiest summer camp story to ever be told, but it creeps me out knowing that that hermit was actually real, and this camp that I thought was fun and was leading a bunch of children to this random guy's house in the middle of the woods was not so fun. 